text this morning is from 1 Thessalonians 4, the last half of the chapter, starting at verse 9. These are the words of God. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the, in, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your word. We commit this time to you. We ask that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and in our lives as the word is sovereign in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing our way through the first epistle to the Thessalonians. And in this next portion of this letter from Paul, we find a marvelous balance between our daily mundane concerns, which all of us have, and our ultimate eschatological concerns, the end of the world, the second coming, our own mortality. So we have ultimate eschatological concerns, heaven and hell, ultimate judgment, day of judgment, end of the world, and then we have Monday morning, Tuesday morning, what we're going to do this coming week, and how these, how these things relate to one another, if at all. A taunt is sometimes leveled against certain Christians that they are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. But this is not how it works, actually. This is not, uh, the, the jab is directed at a certain phenomenon. There are people that act that way, but it, it betrays a real misunderstanding. C.S. Lewis sums up the situation nicely when he says this in Mere Christianity. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. So you aim at heaven, you're going to, earth is going to come along. If you aim at earth, if you set your mind on worldly concerns, you're not going to gain the world and you're going to lose everything. So we're going to see how Paul balances, the, balances these two concerns, the concerns of the mundane and the concerns of the ultimate, the end of the world being that ultimate. So Paul begins this section by saying that he does not need to teach the Thessalonians about brotherly love, for God himself had taught them about that. So in verse 9, he says, I, I don't need to teach you about brotherly love uh, because I know that you're already loving the brothers throughout all Macedonia. And they were practicing what they'd been taught by God to do. They were loving the brothers throughout Macedonia, which you, you, you should recall is northern Greece. Achaia was southern, in modern terms, southern Greece was Achaia, the Roman name for uh, southern Greece was Achaia. Their name for northern Greece was Macedonia. So all through northern Greece the uh, Thessalonians had a reputation for loving all the brothers. Paul's plea was that they do what they, was, was for them to continue to do what they already knew how to do, but to do it more and more. He wanted them to continue to love. You're, you're loving. God's already taught you how to love all the brothers, and you're doing it, and I'm really proud of you, but I, I'm not satisfied. I want you to do this more and more. Verse 10. So, but it's quite interesting, this act of love, remember, in order for this Thessalonian church to have a reputation for loving everybody in northern Greece, this has to be an active, outgoing, uh, outward-facing love. It has to be active love, but it, it must not be understood as busybody love. It's active love, not busybody love. And how do we know that? Well, Paul goes on, goes, goes on to describe how he wants the Thessalonians to live. 
In verse 11, he says, this kind of love studies to be quiet. It studies to be quiet, to mind its own business, verse 11. Working with its own hands, verse 11, as Paul had commanded them. So Paul had told them, be quiet, mind your own business, and work with your own hands. All right? So loving everybody throughout all northern Greece apparently does not consist of bustling around, sticking your nose into other people's business. Minding your, this is a great Pauline principle. Mind your own business. The reason for this ethic was so that they could walk honestly before outsiders and not lack anything. Verse 12. So Paul is urging them in a particular way, and we're going to develop this more in a moment. Paul is saying, I want you to uh, be quiet. I want you to be studious. I want you to tend to your own knitting. I want you to mind your own business, work with your own hands. Now, he then apparently changes the subject, but I don't think he's really changing the subject. He does not want them to be in the dark over what happens to fellow believers who fall asleep in the Lord. Verse 13, they should not sorrow over those, uh, those people who have died in the same way that uh, the Gentiles who have no hope uh, sorrow over their, uh, their loved ones who, are, who, who die. So uh, we have, have something similar come up in the book of Ephesians where Paul says the Gentiles are without God and without hope in the world. Christians, when you, when you lose someone that's dear to you and they go to be with the Lord, you have grief, but it's Christian grief as opposed to pagan grief. When, if you're an atheist, if you're a non-believer, if you're a materialist, when that person is gone, they are gone for good. They are literally gone in every sense of the word. They are gone. And then sometime later, maybe two months, maybe 20 years, you're going to be gone too. So what, you ha- what you're facing when, when someone who is dear to you departs, you are facing an ultimate loss. Christians grieve also, but the kind of grief that Christians go through is the kind of grief that you see in airports. When someone is going to fly away to another country and they're going to be there for two years, you're going to miss them while they're gone, um, and you're going to pray for them, and you're going to be concerned for them, but you know you're going to see them again. That kind of grief, the grief you see at airports of of, of an extended separation followed by reunion is Christian grief. So Paul says, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to grieve the way pagans grieve. I don't want you to um, sorrow, over, uh, the, the, sorrow over those who have departed in the same way that Gentiles who have no hope sorrow over those that they have lost. For, and here comes his argument, verse 14, for if Jesus died and rose, if Jesus died on the cross was buried in the tomb, and rose again from the dead, verse 14. Even so, those who have fallen asleep will be brought by God. So God's going to bring back with him everyone who has died in Christ. So if, and this is all based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The death and resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits of the harvest. There's going to be a general resurrection of the dead, and God... Uh, arranged this in such a way as, as to have Jesus be the first person to come back from the dead in that way. And so because he's done that, we also are going to be resurrected. Paul assures them by the word of the Lord that those who survive to the time that the Lord comes will have no advantage over those who have died beforehand. Verse 15, that was apparently the question. The Thessalonians had lost some people, and they were concerned that the the Thessalonians who had died and who were dear to them were somehow going to miss out. Paul says, no, nobody's going to miss out. And in fact, if anybody has an advantage, they do, because they're going to be first in line. The dead in Christ will rise first. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, an archangel's voice, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be the first to rise. Verse 16. Those alive at that time will follow after, verse 17, and these are to be used by the Thessalonians as words of comfort as they encourage one another. All right, so let's piece these two main uh, pieces together, the, the concern for the mundane and the concern for the ultimate. So here, the great Pauline principle is, mind thine own business. You do this not because you're telling the rest of the body to get lost, but rather because you need to acquire something before you can give it. 
you can't give what you don't have. And whatever it is you have, that's what you're going to give. If you're, busy, if you're a busybody, if you're lazy, if all you do is bustle around and you give that to anybody else, what you're doing is infecting other people with the same sin problem you've got. If you are industrious, if you pay attention to your own business, if you work with your hands and God blesses your work, you're going to have something to give. You're going to have something to share. So you're not dismissing the rest of the body. You are tending to your own business first so that you can have something to give. You cannot give what you don't have and you cannot have something to give unless you came by it honestly. Uh, Jesus says something very similar in Matthew when he talks about the Pharisees who cross sea and land to make a proselyte. And he says, and when you do, you're, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. What happens is no country can export what they don't grow. The only thing you can export is what you're growing. The only thing you can export is what you're manufacturing. What you have is what you export. If you, if you take the show on the road, you're going to sing the song that you were singing back home. If you if you export something, you're going to export what you're doing, whatever it is you're doing. And if you have a corrupt religion, and then you are filled with missional zeal with that corrupt religion, what you're going to export is corruption. What you're going to export is the problem that you have. So, in the same way, on an individual level, if you are hardworking, thrifty, industrious, you're going to be able to give in a way that blesses. If you are not, you're just going to get tangled up with other people. So, you cannot give what you don't have. You can't have something to give unless you came by it honestly. Paul says something very close to this in Ephesians when he tells the thief to work with his hands instead of, instead of pilfering with his hands. The reason is so that he might have something to give, Ephesians 4.28. So, what you need to do is, uh, instead of doing the, uh, the standard was a secular, conservative, hippie punching, right? You know, you walk up and down the streets of a big city telling the homeless bums to get a job, right? Get a job, get a job, get a job. Instead of that, Paul would say, you get a job, right? You get a job and work with your hands. And when you work with your hands, then you're going to have something to give. And because you know the value of work, you're going to give intelligently. You're not just going to uh, spray it all over. So, you, the thief is to work with his hands so that he might have something to give, Ephesians 4.28. Loving more and more means gathering more and more, and it also means being generous with it. So in order to give more and more, there's absolutely no way that you can be long-term generous unless you pace yourself and unless you have some sort of income to be generous with. Everybody here could go count up all their pennies, go count up everything they've got in their bank account, and give it all away, give absolutely every cent of it away, and then the, we're going to be faced with the question of, so how are we going to be generous next week? How can we be generous next week? Well, Paul wants us to be generous in a sustained, long-term way. This is a marathon we're running, not a 100-yard dash. You don't want to be generous in a spasm. You don't want to be generous in a flurry of gifts. What you want to do is be, say, okay, I want to, uh, if, if the insurance companies are right and I'm likely to live to this age, I want to pace myself so I can give the maximum, uh, maximum amount. I want to be as generous as I possibly can. It was John Wesley who said, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And that's the kind of balance that we see, I think, in this text. So we give in order to get. We give in order to get, in order that we might be, able to, that we might be enabled to give even more. We don't give to get in order to then stop and freeze it, right? okay, I'm going to play this game and I'm going to treat God as though he were a cosmic vending machine and I'm going to play it right and then I'm going to give because the Bible says if I give, then it's going to be returned to me, shaken, you know, pressed, shaken down, running over, uh, give and it will be given to you, uh, all of that. And so you name it, claim it, you give in order to get, get and in order to then stop it and then you've got your pile. Well, no, you give in order to get, in order, that, in order to have more resources to give in a disciplined way over an extended period of time. So we give in order to get, in order that we might be enabled to give even more. When it comes to good works, you need to maintain a positive cash flow. You can't be a good works miser, 
and you can't be a good works spendthrift. If you're a good works spendthrift, you're going to run out. If you're a good works miser, you might as well not have earned anything because you're just hoarding everything. If you're, if, if you're doing good works, if you're minding your own business, if you're working with your hands, if you are tending to your own business and being a responsible citizen in the commonwealth of Christ, if you're doing that, God is going to bless it so that you can bless others. But you're going to bless them, not in a spasm, but rather in a disciplined way over the long haul. Notice how this works. Paul tells the Thessalonians that they were already loving all the brothers throughout all of Macedonia. And he urges them on, do this more and more. He wants, he wants blessing for them to grow because they are proving trustworthy with the blessings that they've already had. So God has given them, he is faithful in a little, Jesus says, will be faithful over much. If you're faithful with the little that God gives you, and then you extend it to others, God blesses you, and then you're faithful, uh, you turn that around. Do this more and more, Paul says. With this as the basic baseline charge, what is the action that he then demands? Study to be quiet, mind your own business, work with your hands, conduct your business honestly, save your money. <laughs> and that's not the way we would have gone. We would have said, love the brothers throughout Macedonia, and then a frenzy takes everybody, and everybody goes, blah, and sprays money in every direction. And then, after that, we say, oh no. Oh no, I, I can't help you. This, I, am I, I'm bankrupt. In fact, I need to apply for the deacon's fund myself now. <laughs> do all your mundane work, do all your mundane work with the second coming on your mind. Do all your mundane work with the second coming on your mind. This is a juxtaposition that has radical implications for societal transformation. In addition, keep in mind the fact that even if the second coming does not happen in your lifetime, as it did not happen in the lifetime of those Thessalonians that Paul was addressing, they lived and died 2,000 years ago, and Jesus didn't come again during their lifetime. But keep in mind that even though the second coming did not come in their lifetime, and that seems, in, or in our lifetime, it seems likely, all of us here are going to meet our, meet our maker within 100 years or so. All right? Everybody here is going to meet God, meet their maker, within a, within a century or so. We can't set the second coming. Jesus tells us not to. We can't say that Jesus is going to come next year or a century from now or a thousand years from now. But we can say that a, a hundred years from now, we're going to be with him. We can't say that we're going to meet our maker within a certain specified period of time. And every last one of those Thessalonians that Paul was writing to lived in a particular way and then appeared before the throne room of Christ, before the throne of Christ. So we want to do our work with eternity on our mind. We want to do our temporal work with eternity on our mind. And as we do, that means the temporal work is going to improve we're not going to develop the attitude of a short timer. Um, so when I was in the Navy, uh, we called them short timers. They were guys that had a month left in the Navy and they were by and large useless. <laughs> Try, uh, I'm, they were counting the days, counting the hours. I can sit on the edge of a dime and swing my legs. I'm that short. I'm not, don't, don't pay any attention to me. I've already checked out, right? Well, you need to, wherever you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever job you have, if you've, if you've got your eye on the next job, if you've got your eye on the next opportunity, you still want to work at your per current responsibilities with eternity in mind. You want to work on your current responsibilities with eternity on your mind, even if, you're, even if you know that in six months you're going to go uh, work for another company or you're going to start your own venture. You want to do, do what you do every day with Christ's eye on you. You don't want to labor as a, as a man pleaser, as someone who, who works more industriously when the boss is on the premises, because you're a Christian. The boss is always on the premises. The boss is always there. So everybody here is going to settle accounts with God for the way we've lived our lives, the way we've done our work, and we're going to do that within a foreseeable period of time. No, then Paul then moves seamlessly into his next topic, which I don't think is really uh, a different topic at all. He moves seamlessly into his next topic. We learn that Monday morning in the workplace 
and the end of the world are actually all part of the same subject. Monday morning tomorrow and the end of the world are all of a piece. He is not really changing the subject. In the short time that Paul and the Thessalonians had been acquainted, some of the saints in the Thessalonian church had already died, apparently. That's what provokes the question, likely. Uh, so when Paul writes to them and says, now concerning those who have fallen asleep, I'm assuming that they had written him about some who had fallen asleep, perhaps even as the result of persecution. We don't know. There was therefore some concern among the Thessalonians that these departed saints were somehow going to miss out if the Lord came. If the Lord comes back, then what about the people who aren't here anymore? What, what, what's going to happen to them? Paul says that the benefit actually goes the opposite way. Paul says the benefit actually goes the opposite way. When the Lord comes, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then after that, those who remained alive until that glorious day would be transfigured. That is, what we, that, is what, that is when we will all together be with the Lord, and we will be with him forever together. So when someone dies, they are laid in the ground, and then let's say the Lord comes 100 years after that, that body is going to be raised again from the dead. That person is going to be resurrected. That body is going to be reassembled. They are going to be raised from the dead. But what about, how, and Augustine um, troubled himself a great deal over this question, how can, how can we, how can anybody who survives to the day of resurrection be raised if they never died? How can you be raised if you didn't die? Don't you have to die to be raised? Well, this transfiguration, is, it's not something to be troubled about. This transfiguration is not death, but it's the equivalent of death. It's, it's the same kind of transformation. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about mortality being swallowed up by immortality. So that's one thing. So it's one thing to have your mortality go into the ground and be mortal and rot and then be raised up again. It's another to have your mortality swallowed up by immortality, but it all amounts to the same thing. Everybody gets the same kind of resurrection body. If you died and your body's raised, you get a resurrection body. If you're alive when the Lord comes, you get a resurrection body. But your resurrection body swallows up the old living body as opposed to swallowing up, ra raising up and swallowing up the, de the deceased body. Now, in an earlier message, we noted that not every parousia in Scripture, and that's the word for appearing, not every parousia in Scripture refers to the second coming. Paul uh, uses the word to refer to some, you know, uh, his own coming, to uh, his own appearing at certain places. Some of, um, uh, he even uses it to talk about the man of lawlessness appearing. He talks about people in his entourage appearing. The word parousia does not automatically mean second coming. You have to tell whether or not we're talking about the second coming from the events that are being described. Now, this appearing, this, what he's talking about here in 1 Thessalonians 4, I think unmistakably is referring to the end of the world. Unmistakably is talking about the second coming of Christ and the general resurrection at the end of history. If you have any doubts, look at the events that surround it. There's a general resurrection of the dead. Remember that when Jesus is talking with Martha about Lazarus, uh, and he says Lazarus is going to rise, Martha says, well, I, I know I know that he's going to rise again at the end of the world. Right? So the Jews had a fixed faith. By the time of Christ, the Jews, faithful, pious Jews like Martha, knew that there was going to be a general resurrection at the end of the world. Uh, and Jesus says, no, Lazarus is going to come back. But Lazarus was only resuscitated. He wasn't resurrected because Lazarus died again. Lazarus was resuscitated. He was brought back from the dead, like others in Scripture were brought back from the dead. But all, all of them died again. Jesus was resurrected, which meant that his new body was a transformed body that death cannot touch. At the end of the world, everybody is going to get that kind of resurrected body. Every believer is going to get that kind of resurrected body. But God gave us a down payment on that. God gave us a visible sign that this was, in fact, going to be the case at the end of the world by having Jesus raised from the dead in that way in the middle of human history. The reason we know the Great Commission is going to be successfully fulfilled in this world is because this world is a world in which a man has come back from the dead. There's no way that history can remain the same after a man comes back from the dead in such a way as to be 
uh, not susceptible to death at all. Jesus rose from the dead in the middle of human history, thereby giving us a sure indication that what God has promised for the end of the world is, in fact, going to happen. So, Jesus rose from the dead, and, and, and notice that Paul is banking everything on that fact. If Jesus died and rose again from the dead, then we know that this is going to happen for us at the end of the world. So look, look at how this is described. There's a general resurrection of the dead that has to be at the end of the world. The living are caught up into the clouds. All right? the, uh, so the dead are raised first and caught up and meet the Lord in the air. Then we who are alive follow them. There's a great shout possibly that of the archangel. So we might have two shouts, we might have one. So there's a great shout, and maybe that's uh, mediated through the voice of the archangel, or maybe there's a great shout, and also the archangel joins in. We might have two shouts, might have one. There's the last trumpet blast, so there's going to be a clarion call. There's going to be a great trumpet blast. The Lord then descends from heaven. Now this is not the demolition of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The, I don't think the description fits at all. It's, it's talking about what the Jews were expecting at the end of the world. There were many things that happened in 70 AD that in, described in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 17. Uh, the Lord is very explicit about what's going to happen to Jerusalem. Not one stone's going to be left on another. But when, he's, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, head for the hills, there are all sorts of indicators in those passages that he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Here, he is talking about the end of the world. Now think of, think of a great king coming to visit a city. Now this is, uh, this is something that we have to... Uh, wrap our imaginations around. Think of a great king coming to visit a city. The dignitaries of that city would come out to meet him, but having met him, they would not all go away. They would not all leave. So when the president flies into a city, the mayor and the governor and all the dignitaries go out to the airport. They go out to the airport to meet him, and they don't all climb on the airplane and fly away. That's not what happens. The, the dignitary comes, Everybody goes out and meets him, and then they come back into the city. That's what, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the second coming. So they meet him when he comes, and then escort him back into their city. This is how it will be when the Lord comes again. He appears with great fanfare. The dead rise first. The living are transfigured, and, and they catch up with the dead from behind. So the, the dead are first in line, and we who are alive catch up with them from behind. We all meet the Lord in the air, and then we return with him to earth. And so we will ever be with the Lord. Now, some people say, well, you mean we're not going to heaven? Uh, what do you mean we're not going to heaven? I thought Christians were supposed to go to heaven. Where's heaven in, where's heaven in this? Well, this is not a loss of heaven. It is the remarriage of heaven and earth. It is not the loss of heaven. It is the remarriage of heaven and earth. So in the work of saints in this life, you see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The work you do here matters. What you do with your hands here matters. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We should be able to see God's declared purpose of bringing heaven and earth back together. We see that in Ephesians 1.10. God's intention at the end of all things is the remarriage of heaven and earth. There was a divorce. It was caused by our first parents rebelling. Our first parents disobeyed, and as a result of that disobedience, a chasm appeared between heaven and earth. It's, it was the intention and purpose of the second Adam to bridge that gap, to bring about a remarriage of heaven and earth. And I'll, talk, I'll speak in a minute about what I think that means. The fall was the point, at which, uh, the point at which heaven was removed to an almost infinite distance. But in and through Christ, we are privileged to, to learn that heaven is close and by grace can be opened to us, and it is merely one short dove flight above the Jordan. In Scripture, we have different descriptions of heaven. One of, one of them is that heaven is the highest heaven. Heaven is there's the heaven of heavens, and you get this feeling of heaven is far away. But there are other places in Scripture, and the baptism of the Lord is one of them, where heaven is right around the corner. 
I saw heaven opened. It's just like, it's, it's like a door opens in the sky, and heaven is right there. The dove that came down from heaven was a dove that was not that far away. So what you have, and this is the kind of glimpse that we have, where when the Lord, when the Lord appears and we meet him in the air and we return here, that is not a loss of heaven. What we have is the resurrected it's a new heaven and a new earth come into its final glory and everything is united everything is intact and nothing is out of nothing good is out of reach so when the lord descends from heaven when the lord descends from heaven he will come down to your shop he will come down to your office he will come down to your kitchen he will come down to inspect his workmanship ephesians 2:10 for you are his workmanship, and that means your work is his workmanship. Your, what you're doing, how you occupy your time, is his workmanship. In fact, um, the word that is used there, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, uh, that lest any should boast. Um, it's the grace and gift of God. But then in 2.10 it says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do. So the recipe that you're cooking by, the laundry that you're doing, the software code that you're writing, the children that you're teaching, all of those are the good works that God prepared beforehand for you to do. And you are his good work prepared to do those good works. So Christ is going to come back and see how it's going. Christ is going to come back and he's going to visit your kitchen. He's going to come back and visit your laundry room. And you're going to say, no, no, not the laundry room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Lord's going to come to your house and he's going to open the junk drawer. <laughs> I don't have any junk. Okay, so the Lord is going to come back and he is going to look at his workmanship. That would be you. And the word that is used, uh, therefore, workmanship, is it's like a craft project. It's like you're God's artwork. You're God's craft project. He is an artisan, and he's fashioning you, and he's fashioning you to do good works, which he prepared beforehand for you to do. He's going to look at your work as part of all of that. So do you see the mundane task that you set yourself to Monday, whether it's mowing the lawn or washing the dishes or taking care of the kids or, you know, all of these mundane things. Don't Notice that Paul doesn't say, the Lord is coming, go sit on the roof and pray. He doesn't say the Lord is coming, make sure, you get your, make sure that you're sitting on your couch reading your Bible, having your quiet time when Jesus comes. You want to be at your work. What do you want to be doing when Jesus comes again? You want to be minding your own business. You want to be working with your hands. You want to be interrupted while busy. So he's going to look at your work as part of that. We are supposed, as Christians, we're supposed to be devoted to good works. 1 Timothy 6.18, Titus 2.14, Titus 3.8, Titus 3.14. This is because your work is part of his workmanship. And all of it is under a thick layer of grace, grace upon grace. God designed us for this. We are supposed to be writing poems. We're supposed to be cleaning the attic. We're supposed to be working in the garage. We're supposed to be at the workbench. We're supposed to be at the counter. We're supposed to be preparing meals. We're supposed to be tending to all those things, not forgetting to share, not forgetting to love the brothers throughout Macedonia, but loving the brothers throughout all Macedonia starts with minding your own business. It starts with working with your own hands. It starts with tending the shop. It starts with that. It doesn't stop there, but it starts there. And it does this with you keeping your mind and your heart set on things above. So you set your mind and heart on things above, and you say, the God who dwells in highest heaven, the, the Christ who's going to come again, wants me with my head down looking at this project, figuring out this, figuring out this code, working on this difficult math problem, doing my homework. He wants us to be industrious, solid citizens in the commonwealth of Israel, busy at our work, but with our minds set on things above. Our minds and hearts set on things above. We don't set our minds and hearts on things above and go outside Jerusalem and stare up into the sky. If you do that, the angels are going to say something like, what are you looking to the sky for? You're not supposed to be looking at the sky. You're supposed to be back at your work. 
You're supposed to be back on task. You're supposed to mind your own business, work with your hands, love one another, and do it the way Paul says. Lay it all out. Lay it all before God the way Paul says to do it. Our Father and gracious God, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for the Lord's coming again when it is your appointed time for him to come. We thank you that it's all going to happen in your, in, in your good purpose and plan. And we do pray for that kingdom to come. Father, we, as, we, as we pray, as we long for this, as we seek to have our lives ordered in such a way that's looking at this the right way, I pray you'd remind us of these as we offer back to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, As we come to the table this morning, remind you that we are his workmanship. He's made us. He's made us by his grace, and he's made us into makers, and he's making us into makers as we come to this table. We come to this table, and he teaches us to give thanks. He teaches us to rejoice, and as we do that, he's making us into those kind of people. He's making our tables into those kind of tables. So, what are your tables like? What are your tables like? There are to be tables where Jesus is present, where his joy and his grace is overflowing. Why? Because his grace and his joy are overflowing here for you. He is a gracious God. He has called you out of darkness. He's called you into his light. And he has made you new creations, new creatures in Christ Jesus. So as you come, come in faith, come in joy. He knows what he's doing. He's making you into new creations so that you, too, might be made into new creations, and you might make new creations in him. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. So heaven is not far. Heaven is near. We know that heaven is near because the Spirit is in our hearts. We already have that down payment that heaven and earth will be reunited. But this means that as you work, all that you go to, heaven is right there. We don't know exactly how it's connected. We don't know how our work is connected to what God is doing in eternity, but it is connected. You might remember the end of the last battle where you have the, the uh, dwarves still in the, uh, in the barn, uh, in the stable, and they can't see the new Narnia. They can't see it, and it's, you know, it's right here, it's right here. It's something like that. And don't be the dwarves. Uh, I've got to do the dishes again. I've got, to, I've got to go to school again. I've got to go to work again. No, there's a new Narnia. There's a new world already begun in the resurrection of Jesus and by the down payment of his spirit, which means that everything you're called to this week as a citizen of that kingdom is building that kingdom. So your labor is not in vain. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work and amen.